The Great War, as it became known, began only a decade after the first motor-powered flight by the Wright brothers. The pilots who took part were older than much of the technology available. Many planes flown in the First World War had no brakes or steerable rudder. They were rudimentary in many ways, but they did embody most of the basic elements of today's aircraft. Tail for stability, wings for lift, engine for power, propeller for thrust, fuselage to contain pilot and payload, and simple mechanisms to operate movable parts needed for controlled flight rudder, ailerons, and elevators. A stripped-down example of these planes at the Smithsonian's Air and Space Museum reveals some early genius. The design of aircraft actually stems from bridge building. If you ever look at the truss work in a bridge, uh, the things that the truss wire do, they also keep the fuselage straight as you're building it so you don't have a twist into it. Bracing the truss work to keep the fuselage straight is an intricate process. You adjust each joint or turn buckle to expand or contract the wires. So as you pull on this wire, it might pull a wire over here, which in turn pulls a wire up here. So it's a very painstaking process of of adjusting all the turnbuckles to get it straight. France had seen the fastest expansion of the aviation industry, particularly the manufacture of aero engines. French designs powered many aircraft in the Great War, on both sides. One engine type, the rotary, was revolutionary in every sense of the word. The first complete break from motor car engines, its crankshaft was bolted directly to the aircraft structure so that cylinders and propeller rotated around it. So they decided, well, let's spin the whole engine and it'll be its own best fan to cool it. Fuel flow. Fuel flow. Compact and air-cooled by its own whirling motion, the rotary engine generated a lot of power for its light weight and vibrated less than early water-cooled models. The efficient performance of the rotary engine allowed pilots to carry handguns, rifles and eventually machine guns aloft, a major factor in the aeroplane's evolution as an offensive fighting weapon. Pilots at the old Rhinebeck Aerodrome Museum in New York's Hudson Valley still fly several rotary engine aircraft from the First World War. These are quite powerful for what they weigh. This one is about 325 pounds, and turning at 1300 RPM, which is quite slow uh, by today's standards, but it creates quite a bit of thrust for an airplane of this size. It's an engine that doesn't turn, you know, you think of in today's, today's terms of uh, race engines turning at uh, you know, 10, 12, 10, 15,000 turns a minute. Here it is, 12, 1,300 turns a minute. It doesn't turn very fast. Not much faster than 1,350. The, <laughs> the manual says danger of bursting or danger of rupture at beyond 1,350 RPM. Rotary engines had no carburetor to regulate fuel flow and thus engine speed. So to slow down for landing, pilots had to intermittently switch the engine off. It's certainly one of the most unique sounds you'll ever hear anywhere to hear this engine running wide open, wide open, and then it cuts off. And then it comes back on. And then it cuts off again, and it comes back on. I remember hearing one here for the first time, first one I ever heard, Same coming here. down through the parking lot and hearing this engine, rawr, rawr, you and say, my God, what? You immediately well, assume something's wrong with it. <laughs> I immediately knew that something exciting was happening here. But yeah, it's just, um, you know, it's like getting in your car, putting your foot to the floor, starting the engine, and turning it on and off when you when come to the stoplight. 
The engine had to be lubricated with liberal quantities of castor oil, which spewed out in a fine spray all over the windscreen, the pilot's goggles, and the pilot himself. Airmen couldn't help but ingest a good amount of the oil, making a trip to the latrines the first port of call after a flight. But it's a great sound. In the air, I'm sure it's even better. It, it sure is, as long as it comes back on. <laughs> <laughs> Turning off's not the problem. Coming back on sometimes can be. Our mission, our museum mission, is to save technology. So therefore, we have to go down to the last nut and bolt. Well, preserving history, you can do by books, photographs, this type of thing. With the technology, we need to go beyond the aircraft itself, uh, 1917. What kind of metals, metallurgy, what type of aluminum, uh, what type of designs in the aircraft engines, and how are these developments progressing? We can take something off of the airplane today and tell you exactly how the steel was manufactured in France back in 1917. So it goes beyond the aircraft itself. The Garber facility in Suitland, Maryland is tucked away behind the American National Air and Space Museum. It's here that they preserve, conserve and restore America's aviation history like this Newport 28 fighter that the restoration team has been working on for two years. The Newport 28 was the first fighter used in combat by American units after the US entered the war in 1917. Restoring a complicated piece of technology is a meticulous job. Think of a jigsaw puzzle that's already put together and you take the first piece out and you number it and you keep doing this until you get to the very last piece and then that piece you restore conserve whatever you have to do repair and then you just go back in reverse order seems a little time consuming but that way we can maintain the authenticity of the aircraft It turns out that what's authentic about the Newport 28 are some serious design flaws. 